Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, with a little bit of news about what's been going on over on the Orchestration Online Patreon. Last weekend, I got together with three patron composers for the first of our monthly masterclasses. It was great to talk through certain points in their scores, and also hear what constructive feedback they gave each other. I felt it was a very strong start to this series of composer hangouts. As you may have heard, one of the premiums for Brev and Semi-Brev Patreon supporters is that I'll be posting a new texture every month or so, which will eventually be collected and expanded upon for the upcoming Book 33 Orchestral Textures. So at the end of last week's Masterclass, I gave a short preview lecture on the first of these textures, titled Five Tutti Chords. To keep the rest of the community connected with that project, I'm sharing the lecture here and adding some audio and score excerpts. You can compare the different approaches to scoring and voicing these chords for yourself, and think about what approach could be adapted to your own scoring. Enjoy! If anybody's still watching out there, <laughs> I'm going to talk, talk about the Patreon texture number one, which is a, just, it's really a preview. I'm going to write out a lot of what I'm going to say today, and I'm probably going to forget some things that I should be saying and, um, and add a few things later. Basically, what I've done is score out or diagram out different tutti chords and kind of show an evolution toward a certain type of harmonization and voicing in chords. And also, I want to talk about how 2D chords are emphasized um, rhythmically. So, um, so the first one is Beethoven Symphony Number no. Five, uh, two final chords. First, what he's doing is he is. It's this just that that first chord is the one that he just repeats a whole bunch of times, just just trying to push the audience to see how many chords can he get into a finale before he finally gives you the last note. Okay, so it's a very interesting chord, I feel. Um, the dominant of the chord is played almost nowhere, right? It's only present in the strings, and in, in there it's only present because there is an open G in most of the, you know, it, as people are playing these triple and quadruple stops. So, yeah, so he doesn't really even need the G, but it's, it's implied it's got to be in there somewhere, but there it is. Okay, because this is a root root tonic chord. So that's really he doesn't the sense of overtones will actually have the G within them. So you don't kind of have to overdo it. Looking at each of these um, each of these colors in that first bar, you can kind of see like how it's all laid out. I'm I'm particularly interested in the fact that he's got an octave of first clarinet, first oboe and flute and piccolo. He's got the C octave, so the dominant, and then he's got the major third of the E played by um, second oboe and flute and second clarinet, and then, of course, doubled by the trumpet. And then, of course, below that, it's also played by the, uh, the second horn player. So he's got his mediant to the chord, and then everything playing the tonic, playing the, playing the yeah, just playing that nice big C. So it's a really effective chord. What I feel here is that it's just really, really bright. Um, and just really emphatic, and it doesn't clog on those older period instruments. So there is a reason why it is as open as it is. Now, if you just jump to the next bar, you can see that in some cases, the medium is going down to the tonic just very, very easily from instrument to instrument. And that middle C is just so stacked. Interestingly enough, um, there are like no strings above middle C. But, you know, the strength of the tone of the strings is just so huge on, you know, on that one middle C that it, it doesn't necessarily compete with the clarinets and the trumpets, but it gives a sense of fullness there where you kind of feel something that isn't really there, an octave above it. Um, now, the very last thing in that bar is I've written out the trombones just as a quarter note, boom, and that kind of brings out another, another aspect of... Uh, something that Beethoven kind of helped to carry forward and helped to refine in orchestral scoring, which I don't think he gets credit for very much, um, and that is to have 
part of the sound of a big chord like that to be played by one type of instrument, one family of instrument, and to have the other family of the instrument just go pow at the beginning of it. <laughs> so, so if you look at the at the um, at one B, which is the same exact movement, same symphony, first two bars, I've diagrammed that out without all the colors. But really neat. So trumpet, oboe, and clarinet are playing that upward jump throughout the C major chord. And um, then the um, lower brass, the trombones and horns, and, uh, and bassoons are kind of, you know, playing, mix, mixing around with this voicing, okay, so that it ends up nice and full. Okay, but the, um, the uh, orchestra, the, sorry, the string part of the orchestra is mainly going whap, and so are the flutes and piccolos. They don't really join in on the texture until the very end. And what's cool about that is it's almost like a backward-looking illusion. If you were to sit around and think about that first beat in that first bar and think about, you know, hey, are the strings really playing a nice long tone along with everybody else? They're not, they aren't really. They're using the resonance of the hall and the, you know, the sort of psychological effect of hitting that chord. And then when they come in at the end and they're playing that, you know, that nice... Um, that nice G octave with the, you know, with the E stuck in the middle of it above, and they're just kind of like, kind of sailing on that chord. You almost feel as if you heard something before, and it kind of fills in things backwards. I feel that that's that's entirely intentional. Coping without, you know, without having eight individual subsections within your strings, what do you do? You do things like this, and they end up being really effective and musical. But once again, depending on what is the harmonic function of a chord. Um, that really kind of just defines what everybody was going to do with it, you know, how they were going to score it out uh, up to the middle of the 19th century, really. I was trying to find some good Tchaikovsky examples, but he didn't really write a lot of big tutti chords in C major. The second symphony, I think, ends on a big C major chord, but it is so similar to these textbook, some of these textbook examples that, I mean, it's, it's, it's just redundant. <laughs> Notice that Weber isn't screwing around. He's writing in a slightly later period than Beethoven with this, you know, maybe about 15 years later. And by his time, I think a lot of the instruments are a bit more secure, you know, some of the approach is a little bit better. They're becoming louder, they're becoming, you know, they're becoming better in tune and so on and so forth. So just looking at the way this chord is stacked, it's just, it has such beautiful color to it. So you've got flutes and oboes doubling each other in an E-sixth, and then the clarinet in E-sixth below that, and then the bassoons on that low C octave. And just combining that with the strings, that is like almost like one thing. I almost should have probably put the winds together with the strings there, because that's, that is one harmonic kind of color. And then inside of it, you've got this great, just, just really, really, really cool chord you know, the trumpet's on a C octave, the horn's on a 6-4 octave chord, and then you've got the, your, your, trom your trombone's doing that, that big old tenth voicing. Um, I just really feel that that's, that has just this warm, you know, I mean, if you were going to end a piece, you couldn't use this kind of voicing everywhere, but if you're going to end a piece and people, you know, get people to jump out of their seats and clap, you know, that would be a really great way to do it. But notice how you can have this big warm center to the chord, and you don't have to go nuts. You don't have to write a high E or a high G for your trumpets, you'll still get a very big sound. Now, I was talking about function being a being part of the, you know, way that we think out these voicings. And I really love this second this third chord, sorry, uh, Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. So um, he doesn't really end on any big C chords and in any, any of his movements, but before he's kind of getting ready for the kind of, uh, the sort of the coda to his first movement, he has this big, beautiful um, C major over G chord. So what is the root note? It's being played by, uh, by timpani, just a timpani roll. That's it. And then he's got the cellos and the double basses um, playing a G octave above that. 
then he's got everybody else playing, you know, the rest of the chord, sort of filling that in. Now, when one one of the things that's kind of cool about this is, um, in these types of in these types of chords, and especially for this kind of period, the composers wisely de-emphasize the tonic of the chord, right? So there are some C's written in there, but they're not like you know, where are the weight? Where is the weight of this? Of course it is on the dominant, um, but it's also like the, um, also the mediant is really, really important. So there are a lot of instruments doubling E, for instance. I just think it's a, just a wonderful, bright, open, lovely sounding chord, and yet it has everybody going at it. And it's an example of using everybody, like you kind of have to give everybody something to do um, in, that, in that particular chord. Um, and just using them all really wisely. My, my favorite thing is the fact that the cornets are sort of doubling the double basses and the cellos. I just think that that's a really cool idea um, because that's something that you normally wouldn't think of, right? You usually would think of, of um, double bass being doubled by, say, maybe trombones and tuba and uh, cellos being doubled by, you know, bassoons, trombones, you know, maybe horns. Yeah, a lot of people imitated Symphony Fantastique and, and imitated that, but I didn't. I don't really hear a lot of successful imitations of this kind of scoring. Um, just this kind of wisdom. Now, lists. Le Prelude, and here we've got the second to last bar, okay, and and it's actually not, it's not even that whole bar, it's just the first half of that bar, and I've kind of scored it out, if, if I were really to, you know, all of the note values are different, so apologies for everything being, you know, either just a quaver or a whole note. So here you start to see the beginnings of an approach, which is fill in everything. You know, and this is something that Rimsky-Korsakov was to say, I guess, 50 years later, or by the time he got around to writing his, his principles of orchestration, that's what he was saying, was just, you know, fill in every, every note of the harmony all the way up. And you hear, here you see that kind of a thing. Um, but I just give credit to Liszt because he was trying to have his own voice and his own approach. And let's really look at the way the winds are scored there. I, th I just really love that idea of the C octave being played by the clarinets and then the piccolo above that. And then the flutes getting the, uh, the dominant and the mediant um, and, the, and the oboes an octave below. So you get the flutes and oboes reinforcing each other, which gives this beautiful, it always gives a very beautiful kind of a glowing sound. But then you've got the clarinets and the piccolo as well. So this is the kind of chord that um, if you've got really great players, sounds incredible, but, you know, 35 to 40 percent of the time, it's going to be a little bit like the um, opening of Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream, right? So somebody somewhere in that chord is going to blow it, and everybody's going to say, what? What, is, what was that? So, yeah. Um, then he's got, he's got trumpets, he's got the horns playing a, just a, you know, C octave chord, got the trombones, another tenth voicing, got tuba and bassoons. That's all really kind of very standard scoring, I feel. And then, of course, you got the punctuation of the just the beginning of the chord. Bam. And just a few more words on that punctuation is I feel that, like, sometimes sounds can push sounds. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like... It's like it, it gives a sort of a... You sort of hear something within the tone of the music that you wouldn't normally hear. Like it maybe, you know, does it scientifically excite certain, um, you know, certain things within that chord? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, an, you know, I'm not um, a sound technician, but I just get this feeling when I hear things like that where there is a, a bit of a push at the beginning of something, even if it's just a timpani stroke. Sometimes I feel like it brings out different overtones or different resonances within a concert hall that I normally wouldn't hear if I just heard the people playing that one thing. Or it could just be completely psychoacoustic. You know, it could be something that I'm thinking that I'm hearing that I'm not. Um, 
Um, so just to finish this up, um, the um, Wagner's Meisterzinger. Okay, so here you've got just really fat, rich, um, you know, huge scoring. And, and I feel here that it is a strange thing about Wagner. You know, on the one side, he's really, really inspired, and his stuff really, really works. On the other hand, it's almost textbook in a way. It's almost like he's taking a textbook approach to something, and he's just saying, but this is being done by Wagner, <laughs> you know? So it's got to be like this. So it's almost like something that will really work and then some. Right, so I don't I don't see the same kind of sense of just really free inspiration and imagination. It's more like the other way. It's more like the imagination is coming this way, like a you know like a, a like a sixteen wheeler truck that's lost its brakes and it's just going to smash right into that thing that he's got to score. So it better come up to snuff. Um, so I don't know. Maybe that's just completely subjective, but that's kind of the way I feel when I do things like diagram his chords or or look really closely at his orchestrations. So in this case. You got three brass notes on that C in the middle of the staff, right? So two trumpets. You got a C trumpet and an F trumpet, um, plus the top horn. They're all playing that same C, okay? And then you've got your horn chord below that, and the second trumpet, second F trumpet playing the G. Um, and then you've got your, you know, you've got your stack of winds above that, which are kind of almost like sort of chosen for, you know, for whatever they could do and whatever their registers are, really, rather than kind of in any, any interesting interlocking patterns or any colors or whatever. It's just kind of almost like an attempt to, like, just fill it in with some winds. This, this is what I mean by kind of textbook scoring, is, is what I would feel in there. And then, you know, what can you do? You know, what can the strings do when they've got that much stuff to compete with? Here you start to see the introduction of the string octave. Right, which is like just the most that they can possibly do in a situation like that. If you look at what the strings doing, they're practically all of them are just playing the big C octave. Although Wagner wants wants the string players to play that C, and he wants a little bit more color in his chord, so he's just like they can easily play that as a double stop with the E at the bottom. So he throws in the double stop of the E, but he doesn't really need it because it's it's going to be practically invisible. It's going to give a little bit more warmth. There's going to, it's going to be sort of kind of audible, but really what you're going to hear there are the strings playing those Cs, right? And that just really became almost a, just big, a big approach, and that's still used today for all of you um, film orchestrators out there. And even just having to back up those octaves and you know, take out some of the, some of the uh, wind harmony uh, upstairs, whether you're just playing you know, big sweeping melodies or whether you're stacking chords like this, if you want the strings to come through, you have to practically strip them down to nothing and then give all the harmony to the brass and the and the winds if you want, you know, if you want that big kind of Hollywood sound. So this is this is kind of it isn't really this chord isn't really a Hollywood sound, but it's like you can see how that is kind of opening the door on this and and also leading to, you know, certain types of romantic scoring that you know, we see in, in composers Bruckner, Mahler, and so on and so forth, when they were puzzling out, like, if we do a tutti and we've got all these players, um, you know, how do we have them all play this chord and make it sound good? Um, in this case, Wagner, I picked this particular sample because he's not, he doesn't have, like, um, you know, a ring-sized orchestra. He's just, you know, he's sort of playing fair here, <laughs> and he's just using a regular-sized orchestra. That was my little talk on five different ways to score a C major chord, from Beethoven to Wagner. If you want access to this kind of detailed scoring analysis, some hands-on score evaluations from me, and to watch or even participate in one of our monthly masterclasses, please consider joining Orchestration Online supporters over on Patreon. I'll continue to share excerpts of our premium content in the future, with some masterclass highlights and other useful inside information about orchestration. Sit tight. There's a great deal more to come for the whole Orchestration Online community.